it's lovely to be with you this evening at the end of Big Green Week. Uh, and I join you uh, coming from with the energy that comes from having spent a fair bit of the morning with the climate strikers on Parliament Square. Um, so many young people so determined to, as we were chanting among many other things, system change, not climate change. And system change in terms of food and farming are obviously so essential, so good for all of us, both for planet and for people. And when we think of the, the COP26 climate talks, which are starting in about 40 days time, um, there's a kind of buzzword there. And unfortunately, it's not a very sort of people friendly, public friendly word. We talk about co-benefits, but so many of the things that we need to do for the climate that we need to do to look after nature are also things that improve people's lives. And that means things like cleaning up the air by encouraging walking and cycling and public transport. It means insulating homes, um, as Insulate Britain has so much been highlighting, which means would tackle our excess winter deaths, just give people more comfortable lives. And it means producing healthier diets. And as Kruna said, um, I've been spending a lot of time recently on the agriculture bill. Um, just to tell you where that's at, we've just done two weeks of that in the Lords very intensively. Um, that was at the end of 13 days of debate in total. And we've sent 14 amendments down to the Commons. And when they're back from recess, um, we'll find out how the Commons reacts to those. And indeed, I've got a piece in Left Foot Forward today you know, highlighting how, given all the things that Boris Johnson was saying at a, the UN General Assembly, surely he should be accepting all of the Lord's amendments. Uh, but we'll see how that goes. So as Kruner said, my first degree was agricultural science. And so you don't have to sit there wondering. The accent comes from Australia originally. So when in 2012 I was first elected as uh, leader of the Green Party of England and Wales, the media got very excited about the fact that when you put the uh, ag science degree and the Australianness together, I was probably the only British political leader who knew how to shear a sheep. And the fact they were excited about that probably told you more about the media than it did about me. But focusing on these issues are absolutely crucial at this moment in time after Brexit, and we'll try not to get too bogged down in Brexit, but after Brexit and after leaving the common agricultural policy known as CAP uh, in the EU, um, what's coming next were known as environmental land management schemes have now been rebranded sustainable farming initiatives. And that's what's supposed to be providing farmers with support over the next, um, being phased in over the next few years. But it means, of course, that farmers now are making decisions about what they're doing with their land, managing their land without really knowing what's coming. And that's a huge issue. So what I want to do is talk for not more than about 20 minutes, because I always believe that dialogue is better than monologue. And I'd like to talk about the things that you want to talk about. So do feel ready to ask questions, um, either put them in the chat or, or raise your hand. And so think about questions as you go along. But to set out some things that I think are now utterly wrong about farming and some of the directions that we need to, to travel in. The obvious thing that we need to do, perhaps the most screamingly obvious thing, is we need to stop the factory farming of animals. And there's a huge number of issues around that. And I know probably in Hertfordshire uh, and certainly over in Herefordshire, um, you know, there's really increasing focus on the way in which uh, intensive farming of animals um, produces huge amounts of nitrogenous waste, waste that very often ends up in our waterways, phosphates also, with hugely deleterious effects on our land. We're also, as we start to tackle the issue of air pollution from vehicles, from fossil fuel vehicles, um, the issue of air pollution coming from nitrogen fertiliser and indeed manure application to the land are going to become more and more of an issue. Of course, there's also huge issues with animal welfare around factory farming. Uh, one of the big issues that I think is inadequately discussed and inadequately analysed is the fact that factory farming is food waste. To actually take perfectly good grains, oil and proteins and feed them to animals to produce a small amount of protein at the end of the end of the cycle is a huge waste of food. Um, and, you know, to take America as example, about half of American arable land is growing food for animals. About a third of British arable land is growing food for animals. If we eat 
that food ourselves, um, it's far more efficient and you can actually turn over a lot of that land to rewilding, turn over that land for different kinds of uses for going different kinds of crops. Um, and the other thing that I think will actually be the key factor that will actually, politically speaking, be the first thing to stop factory farming is antimicrobial resistance. So we have a huge problem, and David Cameron actually gave a very big speech on this a few years ago that was made quite a splash at the time, is acknowledging that many of the um, antimicrobials, particularly antibiotics, but also fungicides that we use in human medicine um, are also what um, are used in factory farming of animals. Um, and these are things that are essential for modern medicine. If we lose our antibiotics, we immediately lose all kind of joint transplants, you know, hip replacements, knee replacements, we lose kidney transplants, uh, we lose the fact that now if you, you know, get a scrape on your finger um, and get gets infected, you go to the doctor and get some antibiotics and that cleans it up. If we lose our antibiotics through antimicrobial resistance, then we're absolutely back in the dark ages in medical terms. And I can quote the head of the uh, British Poultry Farmers Association, uh, saying, well, we can't farm the way we do without antibiotics. So you can't ban antibiotics. So I would say that means we can't have factory farming. One of the other big issues that's very much coming up on the agen agenda is the impacts of pesticides and indeed is being, is being highlighted by the um, current issue around our gas supplies and uh, our supplies of carbon dioxide to um, food production, which is a side effect of fertilised production is we rely at the moment on huge quantities of pesticides and artificial fertilizers. Now, there's been a lot of awareness and in the last few years, rising awareness about what's known for shorthand as insectageddon, the fact that we've seen a massive collapse in the insect populations in our countryside. And associated with that, of course, is the birds that feed on insects, um, the um, amphibians that feed on insects, the insects are the base of the food chain and losing those, um, those those insects is hugely damaging. And we had a big fuss and we got more or less banned on neonicotinoid pesticides because of their impact on bees. Bees and other pollinators are absolutely crucial, particularly to our fruit and vegetable crops. Um, without them, you know, apparently it's not entirely true to say Einstein said that, you know, the bees go, then we, the human race goes. But um, I think he certainly thought it, even if he never quite said it quite pithily. And when you come to artificial fertilisers, they are both in their production, um, as the gas issue was highlighted, massively producing of greenhouse gas emissions. And also when they're put on the land, um, a large amount of that nitrogen gases off and goes up into greenhouse gas emissions. And it also uh, goes out into our rivers, into our waterways, which are in an absolutely powerless condition. So you know, the use of artificial fertilizers and pesticides really only started, certainly only a, a, an issue of the last hundred years, um, really only big after the Second World War. Um, so that's in some ways should be the easy issue. And in fact, there was a, a lot of awareness when they first came in of the kind of damage they were doing to soil structures and to soil life. Um, because soils, being an ag science graduate, I can get really geeky about soils, but I'll, I'll try not to do that too much to you this evening. Um, but if you've got a healthy soil and you take a teaspoon out of that healthy soil, you should have a billion organisms in that teaspoon. Um, that small invertebrates, things like tardigrades, springtails, it's worms, of course, it's also bacteria and fungi. And a healthy soil works with plants to keep the plants healthy. Um, once you apply lots of fertilizer and lots of pesticides, you essentially sterilize, kill that soil, leave almost nothing there, and you lose all the services from that soil. So that's all relatively recent developments. The thing that gets a bit trickier is the issue of plowing because we've actually been plowing the soil for thousands of years. But what we're starting to understand now is just the level of damage that's done by plowing and what's known as no till, so no tillage or no ploughing or, or minimum till are becoming much larger um, issues that pushing to the floor for. Because if you think of all of that life that's in the soil, if you go along and plough it up and turn it over and dry it out, 
you know, run some harrows over it to get, make it a nice, fine, beautifully neat looking seabed, you've destroyed most of that life, microscopic life. So we really need to go back to keeping the soil structure intact and using things like green mulches, using things like compost applied on top of the soil, which can kill the existing plants and plant into those. And that, given we're changing something we've been doing for thousands of years, is probably in some ways the bigger, trickier issue. And the other thing that I'd highlight that we really need to change what we're doing, and this really is where we start to get back into human health issues, is the fact that um, more than 50% of human calories around the world come from four crops. Um, that's wheat, maize, or as the Americans call it, corn, rice, um, and soya. So that's more than 50% of human calories coming from those four crops. Now that's a huge issue for uh, crop security because of course, at various times there's been real panics about rusts, diseases of wheat starting to spread around the world. And if you're so reliant for calories on those four, on one of those crops and something takes it out, then you're in big trouble. So it's a problem for crop security, but it's also a huge problem for human health because we actually know that the more variety of diet we eat, um, particularly the more fruit and vegetables that we eat, um, the healthier we are. And this ties in with the human microbiome, which is also one of my av other favorite subjects. So if anyone wants to ask questions about that, I'd be happy to talk more about that. But for a sort of short introduction, if you haven't heard of this, it was only really in the last 10 years or so that people recognized that um, you essentially have an organ in your digestive system, that organ is about a kilo of microbes, uh, bacteria and some fungi um, that um, are essential to our digestive processes that have real impacts on our mental health that are essential for our well-being. Um, we are, in fact, essentially symbiotic organisms. We're a symbiote, a mixed cooperative arrangement of human cells and about 50,000 different species of microbes. Um, and this is where we're starting to understand lots of things about human health that we didn't understand before. And one of the crucial things of that is a mixed diet. And you know, most people will have heard of the five a day as a sort of basic health message, five servings of fruit and veg a day. The interesting thing is actually the nutritionist said that should be 10 a day. But it was the sociologists who said, well, people now eat about two and a half. And if you tell people to go from two and a half to 10, that just looks impossible and they're going to give up. So they agreed on, on five as a kind of middle ground. But for example, the French, um, the advice is 10 servings a day of fruit and vegetable. And that's what we should really be doing. So that's a bit of a, a spelling out of what's gone wrong. What I see is wrong about our current food system, the current way we, we farm our countryside and produce our food. So what should it look like? Now, Kruner in the introduction said, um, I'm a proponent of agroecology. Um, and I did actually, the Soil Association rather liked this. At one point, I was trying to come up with a simple definition of agroecology. Um, and I, I said, described it as being like, stop uh, beating nature over the, the head with a club, um, which when you think about our plowing of the soil and our use of pesticides and, and agriculture and, and uh, fertilizers is the kind of agriculture that we have now. Um, it means working with nature, working with all of those organisms that should be in the healthy soil, um, growing a huge diversity of crops in an acre of land so that you're not encouraging crops and diseases. Because one of the reasons why we're using so many pesticides is we have giant industrial monocultures. And you know, in many parts of Hertfordshire, if you're on a train and passing through it in late spring, early summer, you'll see huge expanses of rapeseed, the yellow flowers. And people sometimes look at that and go, oh, nature, isn't it pretty? Well, what you're actually looking at is a biological desert. Um, that's something that's been sprayed and sprayed and sprayed again. Rapeseed as a crop only really came into the UK in the 1970s. Um, and it's extraordinarily hard to grow and there's huge numbers of pests and diseases. And you think about that great expanse of yellow flowers, what you're essentially saying to pests and to diseases is, here's an enormous feast, come and enjoy it. Whereas if you have a field that's got 
some fruit trees, some nut trees, different small patches of lettuces, onions, garlic, um, brassicaceae, so things like cabbages and broccoli. Um, it's much harder for pests and diseases to get established because there's not that giant feast laid out for them. So what does this actually look like? And I can recommend an absolutely brilliant book here. Um, it's called Miraculous Abundance. Um, and it's a couple of French farmers in Normandy. And they started out with an absolutely bog standard piece of arable land in Normandy. And they applied a lots of these agroecological principles. Permaculture is another approach that's very closely related to this. Um, and they turned this into the most rich, productive, wonderful looking land you can possibly imagine. And one of the things about it is it's been very extensively studied in published in peer reviewed journals. And one of the interesting things was they looked at putting the labor of one person onto a thousand square meters of land and they were getting an income in rural France of 22,000 euros a year. And in rural France, 22,000 euros a year is a very good income. Um, and that's showing how this all works economically, commercially, as well as um, environmentally and in terms of human health, producing huge amounts of fruit and vegetables. And I think that's one of the things that I'd really stress to Green Party people talking about um, agriculture, talking about food and farming is that what we don't want to do is wag our fingers at the farmers of today and say, you know, you're doing terribly. Because the farmers really don't like where they are, but farmers have been forced into the position by the dominance of the supermarkets in our food production system, the dominance of multinational companies. Farmers, they get, of each when you buy a bit of food in the supermarket, typically a farmer is getting 6p in the pound, 6% of the actual income from that food. Most of the, the income goes along the food chain. And farmers have been squeezed down with commodity prices. You know, milk is often sold at below the cost of production. Um, and so farmers have just been left with no choices. And I think of a, a lovely guy who I visited over in Shropshire. Um, he was showing me some trials he was doing with the Wildlife Trust, planting um, understory crops under maize lots of legumes like vetches and clovers. And he was saying, you know, he wanted to do this. Um, this. He could see the difference in the soil. It was blatantly obvious. But he went along his rows of trials going, well, that one costs 20 pounds a kilo for the soil, for the seed, and that one costs 15 pounds a kilo for the seed, and that one costs, et cetera, et cetera. And said, what I'm paid for my maize doesn't pay for any of that. And so that's where farmers have been forced to. So we need to change the whole system. And that means what we need are, are local distribution systems. A really nice word that's applied to this a lot is local food webs. And so a web, I think, if you think of a spider's web, you know, the farmer grows the food. Um, it's sometimes it might be on a community supported agriculture kind of basis where you know, people may perhaps invest in the farm or even invest some of their time to come and help the farmer pick the crops, come and help the farmer weed the crops to do different things. This is part of the community. Maybe the fruit and veg goes into the community through a, um, a box scheme or a bag scheme. There's in um, North London, a wonderful group called Organic Lee, um, which is based in an old council tree nursery. And they're in the center of quite a poor area in North London. And they um, aim to, they don't say they don't have boxes, they have bags because they're much cheaper than, than a sort of typical organic food box. And they aim to really serve the communities around them. And they also sell at local markets and they pay their workers a real living wage. It's a cooperative. And so it's really modeling a different way of growing food, something very different to the supermarket model. And of course, you know, we're thinking about people um, also, like the, um, I used to be involved, I'm sitting now in Camden, uh, and there's the People's Supermarket down in Camden, which was quite famous. It was on the television a lot of few years ago. And that, again, is a cooperative owned by its members um, trying to sell fruit and vegetable from what's essentially a fairly normal local, local corner store, fairly big, but local corner store. And one of the interesting things is because they're focused on the health of what they're selling as well as just trying to sell stuff, they sell about twice as much fruit and vegetable as the average local corner store. So it's a different kind of system, a different kind of model. And you know, this is a whole area where 
essentially you have to look to the Green Party for these kind of ideas, these kind of approaches. With the People's Supermarket, I had, and I don't usually do rows on Twitter because I, I don't really believe in Twitter rows. They're not very productive or useful. But I had to step away from Twitter because I was having a discussion with a local Labour councillor here in Camden who um, uh, was saying, well, I don't see why this this community cooperative enterprise should get any any rate relief, should pay any less business rates than Tesco. It's just selling food just like a Tesco, so why should it get any special arrangements? And at that point, Natalie said, right, I'm just going to walk away from Twitter for a minute or two and come back later. But, you know, we have to have a transformation. And I'll, I'll finish, because I do want to allow plenty of time for questions. Um, I'll finish with a sort of few broader thoughts about where we are now, which reflects on talking to the young climate strikers as I was this morning. Um, where we are now is profoundly unsustainable, economically, environmentally, politically, socially. Um, in our current food system, about one in six people who work in the food system uh, don't get paid enough money to be food secure. There's lots of case studies of people working in supermarkets who have to go to food banks to be able to feed their families. Um, farmers are absolutely struggling to survive. Um, agricultural workers, um, the Agricultural Wages Board, which used to ensure that they got at least a moderately be decent basic level of pay was abolished. And again, there's really no security. I'll be going back when we go back in the House of Lords looking at the uh, post-16 education and skills bill. We have a huge shortage of the skills that we need on our farms. Um, so where we are now is profoundly unstable. And that's good news because things are going to change because they have to change. And looking towards a food system that pays the people who grow the food, prepare the food, decent wage, that pays the people who sell the food, decent wage that's where we need to move towards and so what we have to do is move away from the supermarket model and I think it's interesting because one of the things we've seen around all the discussion of the shortage of HGV drivers and empty supermarket shelves is you know supermarket bosses saying or oh, well, you might not see everything on the shelves all of the time and I think what I would have to say is that you know that is a profoundly wasteful model. I talked about how factory farming is food waste at the start. Well, the supermarket model, if you're gonna have every good that you might want on the shelves all the time, involves inevitably a massive amount of waste. But we cannot afford that food waste. That represents huge amount of wasted human labor, huge amounts of carbon emissions, huge amounts of wasted resources, soil, etc. So, we need to move towards a different kind of model, local food webs, much more local food production, healthier food production. And this is where everything in the Green Party is all interconnected together, because one of the things people might recall a few years ago, there was the horse meat scandal, um, which we found that lots of particularly ready meals, there was a commodity supply of meat, which is supposed to be beef, but somehow or other, quite a lot of horse meat had got into that supply chain. Uh, mostly through fraud, but possibly also just some simple mistakes as well. And um, one of the things that, that exposed was the UK had eight, compared to the rest of Europe, twice as many ready meals as the rest of Europe. Now, it's also interesting that um, the UK has the second longest working hours in Europe, only the Greeks have longer working hours. And we also, on average, commute twice the distance that people in the rest of Europe do. And you think about that, people have worked maybe a 10 hour day, not paid overtime, but worked our 10 hour day anyway. They've commuted an hour and a half or even two hours each day way at the end of that working day. Um, you know, Pre-COVID at least quite possibly on a horribly overcrowded train with their face stuck in someone else's armpit. And you get off the train at eight o'clock in the evening and you could go home and cook a slow cooked vegetable stew, but you're not going to. You're going to fall into the Tesco Metro or all the Sainsbury's local or whatever and pick up a ready meal. So all of these things are interrelated of moving towards a different kind of society. We talk a lot about a four day working week as standard with no loss of pay, giving people more time, making sure people aren't overworked, getting jobs more local so people don't have to commute so far. 
we're building a different kind of society with a different kind of food system. And coming back to where I started about the co-benefits of climate action, action to protect nature, we're also building a much better society, a healthier society for humans. And that's what we're offering, changing food and farming and changing the world and improving our lives. So thanks very much. I'll stop there and I look forward to the questions. Thank you, Natalie, for this very informative and fascinating talk. I've definitely learned a lot. Um, so we, we have one question in the chat, uh, which I will, I will read in a moment. Um, but just to say to everybody, um, please keep on posting your questions. Or if you want to ask questions in person, then just raise your hand. Um, and um, Alex will unmute you, and then, then you can, you can um, ask the question. So we have the first question from Peter Ford. Um, does a truly sustainable food system inevitably mean higher prices? Ah, very good question. Um, I think we would have to say yes. Um, what we need are sustainable food prices. And just like the prices of so many other things, like if you were to go into Primark and buy a five pound T-shirt, the real cost of that T-shirt is not five pounds or anything like it. Um, it's what the economists call externalised costs. So at the moment, um, you can buy, quote unquote, cheap food in a supermarket. Um, that will very often be wrapped in plastic. It will be ultra processed. And you know, one of the interesting things is um, we're starting to realise, and the world is starting to realise, although unfortunately our government hasn't yet acknowledged it, that simply food being ultra processed is it's huge human health issues. Um, so it's ultra processed food, 68% of calories in the British diet come from ultra processed food. So it's bad for health. Um, that means cost, of course, for the NHS in picking up the pieces of that. It's wrapped in plastic, which needs to be disposed of. And that means costs being applied to local authorities. So everyone's council tax bills eventually. Um, there's costs in terms of the way that food was produced. Um, if it's vegetables or grains, um, soil damage, We've around the world got about 50 years of harvest left in the human, left in our soils. And so, you know, everything you're eating is damaging soil somewhere in the world. Um, there's the climate impacts of emissions, there's the damage to nature from all of the pesticides. So, cheap food, you know, the, sh the shorthand saying is cheap food is costing us the earth. So, this is where we get to the whole systems thinking, sustainable development kind of approach, because what we have to do is make sure that everyone has enough income to buy the food they need at a fair price that reflects the true cost of production. So one of the other Green Party policies that um, we've long been championing is the idea of a universal basic income. And that's the idea that everyone should get enough money to meet their basic needs, food being one of those very obvious ones of those every week without conditions. But also, of course, we need decent wages. Um, and attached to those decent wages really needs to be the fact that at the moment we have massive inequality in our society. So Green Party policy is that top paid person in an organisation shouldn't be paid more than 10 times the lowest paid person. And when you actually apply that, um, we think about a real living wage is about £16,000 a year. Um, the Prime Minister is paid about £160,000 a year. Now, you know, one could argue about this, but certainly I think, you know, being a prime minister is one of the more difficult jobs in the country. And so that kind of puts the things into a sensible kind of scale. And if everyone's paid a real living wage, then they paid enough money to buy food at a decent price. So, you know, there really is, to, to borrow an old phrase from Margaret Thatcher, there is no alternative but for us to actually ensure that the true price of food is put on the price ticket and to ensure that people have enough money uh, to pay that price. And, you know, it's an absolute disgrace and a disaster that food banks has been one of the fastest growing areas of British life over the past sort of 15 years. I mean, it used to be that there were hardly any food banks in Britain. And those that were tended to cater to the really excluded people like people with drug and alcohol uh, and mental health issues. They didn't cater to people who worked in supermarkets, to people who were nurses even, you know, people who are now are working but just don't get paid enough money to live on. And you know, my position is that we shouldn't rest until the last food bank 
closes because of lack of demand. Um, and that's, you know, a very vastly changed society from the society that we have now. Thanks very much for the question, Peter. Thank you. Um, Annie has um, several questions, um, so I'll, I'll read them one, one by one. So um, how much do we need to reduce our meat consumption in order to feed ourselves sustainably? Mm -hmm. Are people still allowed to eat meat, allowed in, in quotation marks? Yep. Well, I'll start with the kind of very moderate position, which is the um, Independent Committee on Climate Change, which was set up by the 2008 Climate Change Act. Um, and they are a fairly small C conservative group that tries to think about what they can foresee as politically viable. So interestingly, it's chaired by Lord Deben, who many will know as John Gummer, um, who was um, famous or infamous for um, feeding his child uh, a, a hamburger during the, um, uh, the, the the mad cow disease scandal. Um, but, you know, Lord Deben, you know, he's broadly speaking on the side of the angels now, is chair of the Independent Committee on Climate Change. And it says that we need to cut um, meat consumption by 20%. Um, now, I would say that that figure is, is a lot higher. And I think really what you know, where I started from is we need to end factory farming. And if you think about the massive production of chicken and pork in particular, um, just ending factory farming would inevitably greatly reduce the amount of meat consumption. Now, of course, you know, I will applaud people for climate change or other reasons choosing to go vegan and I'm vegetarian myself. Um, but the focus has to be on ending the factory farming and cutting meat consumption. And if people choose to then eat small amounts of meat, and actually there was a UN body that produced a kind of idea of what a um, sustainable diet would look like. And that basically had about three servings of meat a week in it. So that's the kind of level at which you know, you're still giving people, essentially what happens is meat becomes a treat meat is not a standard part of most meals, um, as it is for many people. Um, so, you know, it's not the world going vegetarian or vegan, it's greatly cutting this back. And a few years ago at Green Party Conference, we did have quite a large debate about whether we should, at that stage, vegetarianism was more the thing. But there are lots of organic farming systems. Um, there are lots of traditional farming systems um, in which animals are very much part of the mix. Um, the animal manure is crucial for soil fertility. There's ways of managing um, particularly cattle so that they trample and refresh the soil and have impacts, regenerative impacts on the soil. So, um, you, I, and even, you know, if we're getting away from fossil fuels, we may be using animals as draft animals. So, you know, the models that most people are looking at, most people looking towards, keeps the option of meat consumption, but it's vastly below the levels of what it is today. Thanks very much for the question, Annie. Good. We have a second question from Annie. Um, antibiotics have dropped off the public radar some, somewhat in the last couple of years. Has anything happened since? Well, antibiotics is interesting because it's something every time I tweet it, um, I get a few people coming down on me in a ton of bricks saying that, um, oh, in the, the UK, um, farmers have significantly reduced their antibiotics use. And that's true, um, but significantly reduced is not ended. Um, and also um, antibiotic use in anywhere in the world is a problem. And I used to live in Thailand, for example, and you know, antibiotic use in Thailand is utterly off the scale. One of the things that we're likely to see with a, if we get a free trade deal with America, is American antibiotic use, as well as growth hormones and lots of other hideous things, um, would be coming into the UK. Australia also uses growth hormone, incidentally, which is part of the Australian trade deal. But also, um, America is about to start importing Chinese chicken. Um, and if we have the borders open, Chinese chicken could easily come to us via America. And you, Chinese antibiotic use, I think, just barely uh, hardly bears thinking about. And of course, the antimicrobial resistant organisms um, don't respect boundaries, as we've seen with COVID-19. Um, the antibiotic use anywhere in the world is a problem for antibiotic resistance. So 
I, I agree that it isn't getting the, the focus it was in the UK a few years ago. And that's partly because we've taken some actions, you know, our vets and our farmers have taken some actions, but really it, 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 the help is very marginal because it is a global issue. Thanks. Thank you. Um, the, the next question um, from Annie is, um, can we grow the amount of food we need without plowing? Mm -hmm. um, oh, okay, without plowing. I, I usually get asked, can we grow the amount of food we need organically? Um, and this is where we come back to the question of food waste and feeding food to animals. If you think about a third of our arable land is devoted to growing food for animals. If you stop feeding human food to animals and only use um, for grazing the bits of land that you can't really do for much else, while also rewilding some of that as well, um, then um, you've got a lot of food supplies there. Uh, I would also stress, and if you have a look at what miraculous abundance achieves, if you farm bio, what's often described as biointensively, so that's farming with a lot of knowledge, a lot of brilliant understanding. And one of the things that um, um, they do on the farm, it's called, uh, forgive my French accent, uh, Farm Bec Halloween, um, that's their farm, is they can get through six or seven vegetable crops in a season grown on the one piece of land. So fast growing, using the soil really well in really constructive ways, using mixes of crops very cleverly, mixes of legumes, etc. cetera. Um, so yes, we could. The diet that that de demands is a very different kind of diet. Um, and the sort of things it also involves is lots of tree crops. Um, and something else people might like to look at is there's a wonderful example of agroforestry. So that means growing mixtures of trees and other arable crops and um, uh, other permanent crops. Um, and this is not a, a no ploughing area, but Wakeland's agroforestry in Sussex um, does amazing things of showing how much more productive the land can be. And this is a permaculture principle if you're growing at three or four different levels. So if you've got trees and then maybe you've got um, an arable crop sown into a mulch um, and maybe you then have like vines like the very traditional um, North American or um, Latin American system of growing together beans, squash and peas, um, then you can actually on the same piece of land be going three crops at the same time. So you're talking about what these are is they're knowledge intensive and they're biologically intensive produced crops in that you're using the land very cleverly, you're working with nature, this is why it's agroecology. And we could grow essentially all of our food like that. Although I would stress also that I'm not um, suggesting we should have what's known as autarky. I'm not saying absolutely 100% of the food on our plate has to be local. You know, I like some spices in my food and most spices we're not gonna grow in the UK. And I like a bit of coffee occasionally. So what we're talking about is most of the food on your plate being local. But, you know, a few special things, special occasion things can come from different places as well. Thanks very much. Yeah, it's excellent. Um, the next question of Romani is, what are your thoughts on E10? Sorry, what are my thoughts on what was I? I'm e last... E10? Uh, sorry, I can't see that one. I've got E10. What are your thoughts on e E10? Oh, 18, right. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, what's the thoughts on, on E10 and how do we change them with rules or incentives? Um, I mean, I, I think it's a mixture of the two. I mean, we have to stop, um, totally have to stop um, um, pesticide use, I would say, or get to the point where, you know, you have to... Um, establish there's a real problem in a particular field and maybe you've got a special case to use pesticides once as long as you've also got a plan to make sure that this problem isn't going to reoccur again one of the things you'll find farmers talk to you a great talk a great deal about is um, um black grass in crops now you've got to look at the the agro ecological um systems uh to do that um and but you know that should we should we need rules, but we also need to make sure, as I said before, that farmers are paid enough. And in terms of E10, 
Um, this is, for those who don't know, is talking about, um, and it's part of a broader issue, about um, using land to grow crops for energy. Um, and uh, this is E10's 10% of your of, um, petrol um, is made from ethanol, which is made often in America from or in Europe from maize. Sometimes it's made from palm oil. It's made from different crops. I think that that kind of bioenergy is an extraordinarily bad idea um, because it's um, using land that we could be going crops on or land that we could be rewilding. Or when you're talking about palm oil, land that could have been left as forest in the first place is the best possible thing you can do with forest um, uh, to produce essentially a, um, a petrol substitute or, 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 or a um, fossil fuel spread out. You know, what we have to do is move towards electric vehicles, uh, but not on a one-to-one -one basis with our current um, petrol and diesel driven cars. We actually have to you know, start with walking and cycling, go to public transport for long distances, and use electric cars for the relatively small number of journeys for which that's not practical for one reason or another. Um, so, you know, biofuels, biocropping, uh, biofuels is essentially a bad idea. It's a terrible use of land. Um, if you're talking about, um, you know, and there are big issues with air pollution, but if you're talking about, say, you know, you're managing your apple trees and you've got some trimmings from your apple trees and you use that to heat your barn, well, that's a different kind of um, a fuel system, which does make some sense, although you've always got to think about the air pollution issues as well. Thanks for the question. Thank you. I've got a um, next question, and I, and I apologize if I mispronounce um, the first name, but it's Marilla Hart um, who has asked, do you have a view on more broadly what the British diet should look like if you were to have a more self-sufficient and local farming system? Please, could you cover fish, dairy, and egg consumption, as well as meat, if you are able to? Other foods that can be grown in the UK, we should eat more of and imported food, example rice that we should cut down on. Okay, so, I mean, what might it look like? I mean, I've already said, you know, we're talking about 10 servings of fruit and vegetable. Um, so let's say you might have um, um, for breakfast, um, maybe you go for a sort of um, uh, a, a fruit salad with three or, three or four different, you know, um, apples, pears, um, blackberries. Um, we'd never seem to have any problem going blackberries. I, I think if you uh, look, look around our, our cities, you can usually find some blackberries somewhere. Um, you might have then some... Um, Maybe you've got one egg with that, um, you know, ideally maybe for some, some local chickens um, and you might have as well some potatoes. Um, nothing, nothing wrong with a nice homemade hash brown um, and that might be your breakfast. Um, if you're going to lunch, well, of course, you know, we, we can still grow plenty of grains for bread. Um, sandwich is a very long time British tradition um, and maybe in that you've got some from aubergines from the peak of summer that you've preserved in oil and, you know, nicely grilled in a sort of Italian style. Um, and then for dinner, um, you know, a big, big vegetable pot of vegetable stew with, with beans in it. Um, and we can grow a lot of beans in the UK. We've kind of almost entirely stopped growing beans. And I have to point people to a brilliant company called Hodmedods. Um, it's it's uh, written as it sounds, Hod Med Dodds. And this is apparently the uh, dialect word in Norfolk for hedgehogs. Um, and it was, an, it was a company that spun out of transition, a transition group in Norfolk. Um, and they now encourage the grow, growing of beans um, and other legumes. And they've had some success also with lentils. Um, and you can buy from them British grown beans. And one of their big success stories is black badger beans, which was a huge crop in the UK um, a hundred years ago and just almost virtually disappeared. So they're actually bringing up lots of these old crops, which did very well under organic conditions before there was anything but organic um, and are getting farmers a really decent return. So you know, there's lots of possibilities there. And of course we're talking seasonality. So we're talking quite a lot of root vegetables in winter, but we're also talking about you know, lots of preserving of, of fruit and vegetables from that summer glut you know, I don't know anywhere 
in the country where you don't reach that point where there is a lot of of, um, of courgettes around. Um, and there's lots of interesting fun things you can do with courgettes. You can make great carrot cake with courgettes, but you can also freeze them and use them later. So it's a case of working with food creatively and instructively, which is where I come back to my point about working hours and people having the time to do these kind of things, which so many people just don't have now. Thanks for the question. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm conscious of time. I, I think we, we plan to finish around eight o'clock. So we have another three questions in the chat and, and I've seen uh, Stephanie um, has raised her hand. So I'll go first for the questions that we currently have in the chat and, and then give a chance to, to Stephanie to also ask a question. So from Peter Ford, uh, we've seen a number of planning applications in house for solar farms on land currently used for agriculture. Is this a sensible, desirable use of such land? Objectors to these schemes often cite the need to maintain food security. Uh, very much so. I mean, I would say that what we need to do is find lots of ways. You know, we've had the government, which over decades has been pushing for farms to get bigger and bigger. Um, and the idea has been that that's efficient. But actually, what that means is using larger and larger machinery, very often grubbing out hedgerows, um, taking the, you know, making the fields larger and larger, which means you don't have the space between fields where you get what are sometimes known as weeds, but are actually wildflowers growing, which is something for our pollinators to eat. Um, so what we want to do is go back to much smaller farms, which can actually be far more um, efficient, bio-efficient, um, and that kind of big field kind of system, which you've got quite a lot of in Hertfordshire, um, it's quite an astonishing fact. In fact, I challenged Peter Lilly at the How the Light Gets In Festival last weekend on this, because back when we used um, horses for ploughing, um, you actually put um, one calorie in the energy the horse put in, the other things you put the energy in to get 12 calories out. What we're doing now with in intensive traditional mainstream farming is we're putting three calories of energy in to get one calorie of food out. So it's wildly inefficient. Whereas if you actually employ, apply human ingenuity, human um, labor, um, then you actually get a great deal more production and a great deal more varied production. And I think it's also worth thinking about the economics of this, because if you start to restore the ring of market gardens and small farms that used to be around towns and cities, there's lots of jobs in that. There's lots of small business opportunities. If they sell, as I was sort of modeling before, through local box schemes, the jobs aren't just working on the farms. There's jobs in marketing. There's jobs in distribution. What you've got is rather than, you know, the supermarket buying a giant supply of something somewhere from a giant farm and running it, running it up the M1 to a giant warehouse and then spreading it out again through HGVs around the country, you've got that local system with money staying locally in local communities, you know, money staying in Stevenage. Um, and then, you know, if you've got a, a local greengrocer, when she needs some um, new shelves, she'll employ a local carpenter. When she needs a new sign, she'll employ a local sign writer. Um, when she needs some, a, 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 you know, someone to sort a lease out, she'll employ a local solicitor. Whereas if you've got everything selling through supermarkets, none of those small businesses have the opportunity to serve all of those food businesses. And so you're talking about a very different kind of economic system, a, a much more prosperous uh, economic system. And um, you, know, the government talks about leveling out. I like to talk about spreading out. So spreading prosperity all around the country and food can be a really strong foundation of that because you know everyone eats, every local community needs a food system. So thanks for that question. Absolutely, thank you. Um, question from Tim Lee. Can the UK feed itself using sustainable methods or would we need to import still? Noting we produce only about 60% of our food presently. Yep, um, essentially yes. And um, if you wanna have a look at this, the Center for Alternative Technology has done a lot of the sort of blow by blow, figure by figure work on this. Um, we're probably not 100% self-sufficient. And as I said, I do like, coffees and you know I'd like to eat a banana occasionally so I think we would keep a small amount of, of production but there is the potential to actually feed ourselves in a sustainable way um you know we you end up doing trade-offs and you start to think about you know 
maybe we might want to still bring some food from Holland or somewhere. You know, Holland is actually closer to large parts of the UK than is Scotland or Northern Ireland. Um, you know, we don't necessarily want to draw, draw rigid national boundaries and say, right, we're not taking anything from anywhere else. Um, you know, transporting um, food by, um, by ship can be quite an efficient method of, of transport potentially. So, you know, I wouldn't say we want to go for, you know, 100% or even sort of 98% plus a few spices and a bit of coffee. Um, but we can substantially produce enough to feed ourselves. It's a different kind of diet, but it doesn't have to be, you know, any kind of worse. In fact, it's a much healthier diet. And, you know, with a bit of ingenuity and, you know, lots of vegetarian cookbooks, we can feed ourselves very tastily as well. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, we have time for another couple of questions. Um, so a question from Dear Linda in chat. A Stop Ecocide campaign um, has been trying to raise the public awareness of their proposal. What are the chances of it being recognised and supported by the UK? There is very little talk and understanding of the relevance and usefulness even among Green Party members. What do you see would be the benefits of implementing Ecocide as a crime in the UK law? Okay, well, just to start with the sort of very basic factual point, um, this is a long time campaign. I actually went to an event at the British Library in about 2008 on this, and it's to add to the Rome Statute, which creates, which is the statute that sets out war crimes, um, the crime of ecocide with an obvious parallel to genocide. And I'm pleased to say that um, we have actually made a really large amount of progress on this, and I'm quite proud of this, and it demonstrates what we can do by having Greens in the Houses of Parliament, is in the Environment Bill, I put down at um, committee stage, which is our first stage, stage of serious debate on a bill, I put down two amendments to the Environment Bill that would have actually created a domestic offence of ecocide, and that would have committed the UK to supporting um, at meetings of, of the assembly of the of the Rome um, Convention, um, the UK internationally supporting it. Now, that was pushing the government a very, very long way, and I wasn't expecting to get that far. But we actually had a really good debate, and you can look this up if you look at my website, which is just nataliebennett.org, um, and you find the um, the list of um, by year. Just search ecocide. You can find all of these debates. Um, and then at committee stage, um, I put it in a watered down amendment, which basically said the UK would commit to supporting debate about ecocide. And this was what the Stop Ecocide people had asked me to do, and what we saw as a reasonable step. And this is where I get to share a bit of the, the fun of this, because I was working very hard to get a concession from the government. I was threatening to call the vote. And so I was keeping all the Tory peers in the House very late in the evening um, as I was threatening to call the vote and seeking a concession from the government. And we got that that close. We almost got it, but we didn't quite get it in the end that I had to take the whip off because otherwise I would have got lynched. Um, but we have very much put the debate about ecocide at the absolute centre of the government. Um, we've had um, Zach Goldsmith, the minister, saying, you know, he thinks this is a very interesting idea and needs to be explored further. Um, and I'm confident we're going to see some real progress from this in the UK very soon. And the Stop Ecoside people are very happy with what we've achieved thus far. They're actually tweeting that either this morning or yesterday. Um, if you look at the Stop Ecoside Twitter feed, you'll see that they're actually very much thanking the Greens for what we've achieved on this. And um, just so everyone knows, this is actually Green Party policy. I think it was, from memory, it was 2011, we passed supporting the creating the crime of ecocide as a Green Party policy. So this is very much there in, in Green thinking. And it's something also I know the European Greens in the European Parliament are working on as well. So definitely being worked on and progress definitely being made. So thanks very much for that question. Excellent progress. Thank you. We now have time for, for final questions. So Stephanie, um, I don't know if you can unmute yourself or whether Alex can help with that and, and so you can ask your question. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you very much. And thank you, Natalie, for your thoughts and your insights. That's been really interesting. Um, I really share your concerns on factory farming and uh, and not just me, but also I work for an organisation, Humane Society International, and, uh, and we have those concerns also. Um, and I think um, we, we've all seen the shift, I think, generally from people in terms of plant-based diets. 
for whatever reasons, you know, whether, whether it's environmental or um, economic or health or um, ethical reasons. Um, and you mentioned the uh, Climate Change Committee's recommendation on uh, meat and dairy reductions. And uh, I've seen in the report, they also say very clearly that we need sort of robust, um, clear government policies to help people uh, make those shifts, to help businesses and to help farmers also. So I just wondered what your thoughts were on what the government should be doing to really sort of inspire people and encourage people to, to shift in that way. Thank you. Thanks very much for the question. And yes, I mean, it's interesting that um, Jenny put down an amendment on the environment bill because Jenny Jones, my fellow Green peer and I, we share um, uh, issues between us. So on the environment bill, we sort of, we, we roughly did 50-50 amendments and debates, et cetera. So Jenny put down the amendment on this, um, and as you might expect from the House of Lords being both a very small C conservative place as well as a, as a um, place with lots of conservatives with a capital C in it, um, there was a lot of negative reaction. So it was quite fun because I actually spoke after her in the group, um, and I did manage to sort of respond to a, a lot of those concerns. So, I mean, you know, the government, it, with you know, their response will be, "Oh, nanny state, oh, you can't tell people what to eat." Um, we will keep banging away at this. Um, and, you know, if, I think the factory farming is, is the route, politically speaking, the route that the government finds it's hardest to argue against. You know, the, the Committee on Climate Change recommendation is there as well. But in terms of practical steps, I mean, I think one of the things that um, we could, should do, and this is a much broader issue than, than just this, is the government refuses to use public procurement to start to change the way people eat. And if you look at um, lots of European cities, you know, politically, there's been the leadership to say, we want to feed particularly you know, people in our schools, people in our prisons, people in our hospitals much better. And you can you know, say that you know, feeding people better means feeding them much less meat. Um, it means not feeding, feeding them factory farm meat. It means feeding them beans. It means feeding them lots of fruit and vegetables and locally grown fruit and vegetables. So one of the things the government should be doing is using public procurement to change people's diets and you know make it in schools and that that the majority of what's on offer is vegetarian um you know generally speaking at the moment you know in lots of government institutions you have one um vegetarian option now i've got a problem because i'm i have to be gluten free for medical reasons um and you know it's pasta an astonishingly large amount of the time which i can't eat um so making sure there's more vegetarian options that you're buying fruit and vegetables, you're buying beans through public procurement. That's something that could be done. And, you know, the arguments for this can be made on health grounds as well as environmental grounds. And so, you know, you come at them from different directions with as many arguments as possible is I think really vital. Um, and what I said about externalized costs, what we've got to do is make sure that people actually meet the real, you know, the, the price on the price tag meets the real costs. And if you do that, when you think about all the externalized costs, particularly of factory farming, but also of, of, of all forms of, of meat and dairy production, um, then, you know, you lift the price. Now, you've got to be careful with that, because, of course, at the moment, so many people are struggling to put any kind of food on the table. And, you know, cheap, ultra-processed PAP, um, if you, you know, in the frozen food aisle, um, there's lots of things there that people feel like that's what they've got to buy because their kids have got to eat. So, you know, there's all sorts of things you can do about education, um, you know, bringing food education back into schools, bringing cooking back into schools, teaching people how to cook, doing community courses to help people to learn how to cook. Um, but also, you know, people have to have the time. They've got to have the energy. They've got to be able to pay the fuel bills. Um, lots of the poorest people live in places where they don't have cooking facilities. And you know, so there's so many areas to come at, but I, I'd say the number one thing in the totally unaddressed area, and I think it's something you know groups can campaign on, is public procurement. Is something I'd really like to see more campaigning on, public procurement, education, and then moving on towards looking at the actual real costs. What's it actually really costing all of us um, to have this heavily meat-based diet? Um, but what I'd also say is, you know, I think it's important sometimes when we talk about plant-based diets. We're also talking about ultra processed pap and we have things that are actually plant based, but they're molded so that they look almost like they're like they're meat. And we really want to try and move away from that, you know, plastic wrapped, heavily processed pap and really look to actually consuming fruit and vegetables in more or less their natural state. 
and that's really the kind of plant-based diet we need to we need to encourage and focus on and that's something i think perhaps some of the campaign groups be good to look at that as well because you know um greg's vegan sausage roll is not the answer to anything <laughs> thanks thank very you. much <laughs> thank you thank you very much natalie we will come to the end of this webinar and thank you everybody for, for all your questions, but um, thank you Natalie for your time and for this very interesting talk. Um, and um, you know, I hope we hope we'll have the opportunity to to run another webinar in the near future. Thanks everyone. Thanks for the great questions and discussion. Have a lovely evening. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you.